Okay, last Sunday we started a series of sermons. It's only going to be four lessons, but a series of sermons on the kingdom of God. And we did that because in, in the church, in church circles, we often hear the phrase, the kingdom of God. It's used in conversation. But there seems to be a lot of ambiguity, a lot of confusion, maybe a lot of misunderstanding about exactly what the kingdom of God is. And as I mentioned last week, the purpose of this short series of sermons is to identify what is meant by the kingdom of God as it's used in various statements in Scripture. And you see, I'm convinced that it will be helpful if, if we begin, and we did this last week, but if we begin by examining the fact that one of Jesus' parables reveals that there are four distinct stages or phases of the development of what the Bible calls the kingdom of God. He said this in, in one of his parables, in one of those stories that he told. It's recorded in Mark chapter 4, some excerpts from verses 26 down to verse 29. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So he doesn't leave us any um, confusion about what he's going to be talking about. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. The seed sprouts and grows. Now get this. First, the stalk. As we learned last week, that first developmental stage of the kingdom of God was the nation of Israel. As God ruled over them as their king. Then the head. And that's the predominantly Gentile church. That's who we are. The kingdom of God today is composed of people in whose hearts Jesus rules as king and those people just naturally obey him. They serve him through the ministries of a local church. That's the kingdom of God. It's the, today it's the predominantly Gentile church and we'll see more about that in a few minutes. And then he says, and then the full kernel in the head. That's another developmental stage, and that's what we call the millennial reign of Christ on earth, that 1,000-year reign of Jesus on the earth when he comes back again. And then he says, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And that ripe grain is the eternal kingdom of God on the new earth surrounded by the new heaven. So there are four distinct developmental stages of the kingdom of God. Obviously, in these verses, Jesus indicated that to be the fact. Um, from the production of the stalk until the grain is ripe, there are those four distinct stages of development in God's kingdom. And, and we know that he's talking about God's kingdom here because he started out by saying this is what the kingdom of God is like. Now, last week, we examined the first of these four stages of development in the kingdom of God. We talked about the nation of Israel, and it's so crucial that you understand the important emphasis that God places on the nation of Israel in Scripture. Uh, we need to understand this today. This is not a political statement. This is a biblical statement. You need to be pro-Israeli in your outlook on life. We need to elect leaders who are pro-Israeli in their foreign policy ideals. Because God said to Abraham and his descendants, that's the, that's the modern day nation of Israel, God said to them, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. If we want America to remain under the blessing of God, then we must be pro-Israeli in our foreign policy. And, and uh, you know, the election's coming up in November, and one of the most important things you need to ask about any candidate that you are considering voting for is what is his stand on the nation of Israel? Is he anti-Semitic or is he pro-Israeli? We need to be voting for pro-Israeli people. I'm not endorsing any candidates. I'm telling you that that is a biblical issue that we need to be aware of. And so we talked a little bit about the nation of Israel last week. And so um, then today we're going to examine the second of these four stages of development in the kingdom of God, and that's the predominantly Gentile church. He refers to the church and this stage of the development of his kingdom when he said, then the head. You know, the stalk sprouts up, then what happens? A head of grain begins to form at the top of the stalk. Now, before I jump into the, the theology behind all this, I want to tell you, 
in our current culture in America and in other places on the planet, people view the church as obsolete, as unnecessary. People say, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. This is what I want to tell you. You don't have to be a Christian. You know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian and you know, to be a believer and get eternal life. But you have to be a part of a local church to be a good Christian. Because that's what Jesus said to do. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together like some are doing. But, but he said, we should be doing this that much more as we see the day of his return approaching. We need to be connected to a local church so that we can get encouragement and support so that we have the opportunity to serve in various ways so that we can be an encouragement and a source of support for other people. God didn't call us to be Lone Ranger Christians. He called us to be sheep in a flock. That means we're supposed to be together. And, and that togetherness happens in the context of a local church. So we need to, we need to understand that. Now, when the vast majority of the Israeli nation rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and you just casually read through the four Gospels and you see that they did that. They rejected him as their God-sent human king. He was their king. He came to be their king and offer them the kingdom at that point. But they rejected him as their Messiah. Rather than inaugurating him as their king, they crucified him on a cross. And when they did that, they temporarily forfeited their opportunity to function as the kingdom of God. And God offered the Jews that opportunity first. But then when their unbelief caused them to reject their Messiah, their king, then, then God turned to the Gentiles and offered it to them. And he developed this predominantly Gentile church to function as his kingdom. Paul hinted at this transition from the Jewish nation to the Gentile church when he wrote this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of the Jesus story because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I want you to get that. Do you know why in so many churches and so many religious settings so few people get saved? Because the gospel, the Jesus story, is not presented on a regular basis. What is the power that gets people saved? It's this story. It's the gospel. That's what Paul said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew. So who did he come to and offer the gospel to first? The Jews. Why did he do that? He was offering them the opportunity to function on earth as his kingdom. But in mass, they rejected his gospel. They rejected him as their king. And so he temporarily set the nation of Israel aside and he turned to the Gentile church. Paul says, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. A Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. I dare say everybody in this room today is a Gentile. I doubt that any of us are Jews. You may be and I just don't know it. But that's what he's saying. He, first he offered it to the Jewish nation. Then he turned and offered the opportunity to function as his kingdom on planet earth to the Gentile, predominantly Gentile church. Paul indicated when he wrote to the church of God that was at Corinth that from his perspective at this time in history, at Paul's time in history, that the church and the kingdom of God were essentially the same. This is what he wrote. It is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 to 20. Notice what he does here. He says, I am sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love. Now, you've got to understand that when Paul calls Timothy his son, it was not his biological son. He was his son in the faith. He was the spiritual result of Paul's ministry. Paul led Timothy to Jesus, and so he viewed Timothy as his spiritual son. And so he writes this, this information um, to the people at Corinth about Timothy. He says, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. You know, I, I, I've often read that, and I thought, you know, if God chose to put, write down something about me, I hope he would write He's faithful in the Lord. 
That takes precedence above just about everything else in the life of a Christian. Not he's successful, not he's good looking, which of course I am. Um, not that he's highly intelligent, which of course I am. You know, not all of that, but what? He's faithful. That should be the goal of every one of us. To just be reliable to do whatever Jesus asked us to do. And so he says that about Timothy. He says he's faithful. And then he says, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus. Now I like this. Which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Now I like that. Do you know what Paul says there? I'm living it as I teach it. Do you get that? If what you live doesn't agree with what you teach, your teaching will be highly ineffective. Do you get that? I mean, how effective would it be for me to harp at you every Sunday that you need to be telling the Jesus story and, and helping people respond to that by believing in him and getting eternal life if I wasn't doing it? How effective would that be? How effective would it be if I tell you over and over and over again you need to read your Bible every day? so that you can grow spiritually, have a steady intake of the Word of God. If I wasn't doing it, it wouldn't be very effective at all. How, how effective would it be if I tell you, you need to be faithful and come to church on a regular basis. You need to very seldom miss coming together and exhorting one another and encouraging one another like, like the Bible says for us to do if I wasn't here on a regular basis. It wouldn't be very effective. And so that's what Paul says here. He says, he's going to remind you of my way of life. In Christ Jesus and then the big thing that he's going to remind you is that my way of life agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church some of you have become arrogant prideful puffed up proud as if I were not coming to you evidently they were doing some stuff that Paul thought they wouldn't do if they were convinced he was going to come back again to see them and to confront them and he says but I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. I want you to really get that. The important thing wasn't what they said. People can talk a good talk. Isn't that right? But it wasn't the talking that was important to Paul. He says, I'm going to find out not, not only what these arrogant people are, are talking, how they're talking, but what power they have. The important thing is not what you say. The important thing is what you have the power to do. The spiritual power that you have in your life to accomplish what God has put you here to do. That's the important thing. It's not all the good stuff you talk about. It's what you do by the power of God in your life. How are you building up his kingdom? How are you making an eternal difference in the lives of other people? That's the important thing. And then look what he says. Because. Now, who's he, who's he talking about in this? He's talking about what I teach everywhere in every church. And then he talks about the people specifically at the church at Corinth. And then look. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk but of power. In that section, he seems to be using every church as a synonym, as an, an, an equal statement to the kingdom of God. He talks about every church, and then he turns around and says, this is all true about every church because the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. You get that? Where were these people who were talking but didn't have any power? In the church at Corinth. And what does he say? It's not a matter of talk, it's a matter of power. And then he talks about that that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Do you see he ties together the church and the kingdom? So what is the kingdom today? People who have submitted to the kingship of Jesus over their life, and as a result of that, are functioning as a part of a local church. He seems to be just tying the two together. However, he also seems to indicate that not everyone who claims to be part of the church is actually part of the kingdom. Just because you talk a good talk, 
Just because you say, oh, but tell you what, that open door church, that's my church, but you very seldom show up. You very seldom actually function as a member of the body. You very seldom participate in any kind of ministry. Uh, there may be times that you're more a detriment than, a, than a, 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 more of a liability than an asset to the kingdom of God, to the church. And what does he say here? He, he, he indicates that, that just because you say you're a part of the church, just because you say you believe in Jesus, just because you say that you're a, a member of such and such church does not necessarily mean that God views it that way. If you have not submitted to the kingship of Jesus, God does not view you as part of his kingdom. How do we know this? Because he says it. He says there that only those who have submitted to the kingship of Jesus and as a result are living by his power are part of his kingdom because they by his power function with all their giftedness, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the direction of Jesus. They function as a part of a local church because this is what he says. He says there in verse 20 in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of what? Power. But of power. Two chapters later in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul even more clearly stressed that those who are living wickedly, and they had some of that going on in the church at Corinth, didn't they? I mean, if you go back and read those letters that Paul wrote to them, there was obviously some wicked stuff going on in that church. So sometimes people get all upset because something goes wrong in a church. I tell you what, I ain't staying in this church because so-and-so did this or did that or did something else. Is that anything new? Back in the church at Corinth in the first century, there was some wicked stuff going on in that church. And Paul addresses that. Look at, look at what he says here. He, writes this, he writes, writes this letter to them because there were people uh, who were living wickedly in that church. They weren't living by his power. Um, and as a result, from Paul's perspective, they were not part of the kingdom. They hadn't submitted to the kingship of Jesus. They weren't letting him rule their lives. And look at, what he, look at what he asked in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. He says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? What's he saying there? You want to be a part of this kingdom? You got to believe in me and let me be the king of your life. And let my power fill your life so that you no longer have to live wickedly. If you're still living wickedly, if you're still living immorally, if you're still living outside of the boundaries God has set for you, and I'm not saying you're sinless, but if there's no desire in your heart, if there's no change in the way you live so that you are no longer living wickedly, but living according to the power of this God who has become your king, then Paul says, don't you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom? Of God. That's a pretty serious statement, isn't it? Then he explained, do not be deceived. He, he wanted them to really get that. This, this is what he is considering examples of wickedness. This, this is what he says. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral. Ooh. How much of the church do you think that trims down from God's perspective when he looks at the kingdom? Ooh, trims it way down, doesn't it? So, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor female, or nor, excuse me, male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy. Ooh, that might be getting close to home. Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, here's another one, nor slanderers. What does it mean to slander somebody? It means to just be spreading trash talk about them that's not true. And even if it is true, you're spreading it with the motive of doing harm. That's slander. And he says, you do that, and what's he saying here? He views that as wicked, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom. You're not going to be considered from God's perspective as a part of his church. Nor swindlers. Oh, what's a swindler? Somebody who's trying to get one over on you. Somebody that's trying to financially uh, 
uh, deceive you and, and get you to uh, uh, you know, invest money in something or give them money for something that they have absolutely no intention of using for the stated purpose and they're just trying to get you money. Isn't that a swindler? Aren't you glad we don't have any of that today? Get that? I don't know how many times I could tell you that you get these scam deals coming over the internet, right? And they want you to send them some money with the promise of all this stuff. I hope you are all intelligent enough not to send anybody money over the internet that you don't know. Swindlers are out there. And he says about these people, they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they have not submitted their lives to the kingship of the king. They're not living by his power. They're living by the power of their own flesh. And as a result of that, they do wicked things. That's what he's telling us here. So it appears that from Paul's perspective, only those who had submitted to the kingship of Jesus and were living by his power were included in his kingdom. Some of the people in the church at Corinth had been in exactly that condition in the past. There might have been some that heard him read this letter that were in that condition at the present. But we know that some were in that condition in the past. They, they were talking a good talk, but they had no power because they hadn't submitted to the kingship of Jesus. They were functioning as if they were members of the church, part of the kingdom, when in reality they were not. Uh, there were people who had been in that condition in this church at Corinth. However, God had brought them through a process by which they had gained access to his kingdom. God worked on them. God brought them through a process. Paul wrote about this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11. He goes right on. This is the very next verse. After he tells them about these wicked people who are not going to inherit the kingdom, then he says this. That is what some of you were. What tenses were? That's past tense. He's saying they're no longer that way, but you were. So if, if we get some people around us and we look at them and we say, look at their life, they're doing all this wickedness, and yet they claim to be a part of this church, they claim to be a follower of Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we look at them, should we um, turn up our nose at them and just want to just abandon them? No, what we ought to do is pray for them. Pray that God will do a work in their lives. Pray that God will bring them through this process to change them from what they are to what God wants them to be. And so because he says that, that is what some of you were. But, I like that word, because it means they're, they're really, they're still not that way. God has done something to change that. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is what you were God brought you through a three-stage process so that you are not that anymore. And so let's look at the process. Because it appears that entrance into the kingdom of God is a result of a process through which God brings his people. And it's more than just saying, okay, I believe the Jesus story because I don't want to go to hell. Jesus has to be more to you than the lifeguard at the lake of fire in order for you to get in the kingdom. Do you understand that? He wants to be your king. So let's examine this process. First, Paul wrote, you were washed. This spiritual cleansing occurs the moment a person understands the Jesus story and believes it. If you really understand it and if you truly believe it, then the Holy Spirit comes in and brings this new kind of life and he washes away the old life. That's what Paul is, or that's what Jesus explained to Nicodemus. And, and he explained, described that particular experience to Nicodemus when he said this in John chapter 3, the last part of verse 3. He said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. See, when you're born again, every time somebody's born, guess what happens? New life. You get that? Every time somebody's born, guess what? They're automatically born into a family. You say, not me, preacher. Yes, you. You say, I, I gave up on my family a long time ago. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that, but God didn't give up on them. God put you in that family because God knows that is absolutely the best family that you could be in. I struggled with that for a time in my 
spiritual walk because I came out of a really bizarre family. My mother's sitting here and she knows that. I mean, there were all kinds of dysfunction. Our family back in the 1960s and 70s would have been the perfect poster child for the dysfunctional family. But guess what? God knew exactly what family I needed to be in to develop me into the man that he wants me to be. Do you get that? Sometimes God has to put us in some pretty tough situations to file off the rough edges, to teach us some lessons that we would otherwise never learn, to develop us into the people that he wants us to be. So don't whine. Thank God for whatever he's done in your life because whatever he has done is designed for your good. Isn't that Romans 8, 28? You know, this is not in the notes. You realize that. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Nothing ever touches you that God didn't design for your good. So I had to come to grips with the fact that though I was born to a man who was Maybe had some mental illness, definitely had some issues um, in his life, um, definitely was not a very loving, gentle individual, uh, very abusive at times. Even though I, I grew up with that, I had to come to grips with the fact that God knew I needed that. You get it? And so God is not concerned about your comfort, He's not concerned about your pleasure. He's not concerned about you just having such a sweet and gentle life experience. He's concerned about developing you into who he wants you to be. And because some of us are so hard-headed, he has to go to drastic measures to do that. So we just need to grab hold of that and understand that. And, and I want you to get this too. I want you to get the fact that, that all of that that God does is designed for our good. And, and the first part of that process is, is when when we believe in Jesus and he washes us, we get born again. We get this new life. We get this new family. Now, John referred to this spiritual cleansing over in 1 John, same guy that wrote um, the Gospel of John, wrote 1 John, and this is what he said. He said, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us. If you're reading the King James Bible, it says cleanses us from, I like this, from all sin. I really like that. Now, some people, when they read that, they limit the word all. They want it to mean all my past sin. But now, when it comes to dealing with my present or future sin, then that's in my ballpark. I got to deal with that myself. You know, I got to beg God for forgiveness. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do something else. What's that verse say? The blood of his son cleanses us from how much sin? All. Past. Present future. Rather than begging God to cleanse us of our sins, we really ought to thank God that the blood of Jesus has already done it. So we need to grab that and understand that. Okay, let's look at the second one. The, the cleansing has occurred. Then the second phase of this, uh, of this process, he's, he, he wrote it like this, you were sanctified. You are sanctified. The word sanctified is translated from a Greek word that means to be made holy, to be set apart for sacred use. The process of sanctification enables God's people to be more and more like Jesus. Sanctification starts the moment you believe in Jesus. But there is a progressive continuing side of sanctification where he just keeps working on you to make you more and more like Jesus. And so this, this process of sanctification, it enables us to be more and more like Jesus. Paul described to the believers at Corinth, described it like this. He wrote it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, some excerpts from verse 15. He wrote, and we, I want you to get this, here's, here's the progressive side of sanctification, and we are being transformed. Are being what tense is that? Present continuing tense. Our being transformed. What does that mean? Changed. What's God doing continually in our lives? 
He's arranging circumstances. He's bringing difficult people into our life. He's bringing helpful people into our life. He's putting us through all kinds of stress and struggle and issues. He's giving us, letting us experience disappointment. He's letting us experience victory. He's doing all kinds of things in our lives. Why is he doing that? To change us. You know what that means? I hate to break this to you. You know what that means? God is not satisfied with us the way we are. Nobody has arrived. You say, I'm so glad I'm spiritually mature now. Wow. That's just a good indication that you're not. So what's he saying here? He's saying that God is continually at work. At work, because he says, and we are being transformed into the likeness, into his likeness, with ever-increasing glory. Do you know what glory means? means to look good. When we give glory to God, we're making God look good. You know what God's doing on us? He's working to change us so that in the eyes of a broken, demented, deceived, distressed world, we look good. They may not agree with us and they may think we're fanatics and they may have all kinds of bad things to say about us, but when push comes to shove and they get in a desperate situation, real often... They'll search out some pastor or some rabbi, some priest, some, some Christian, because all of a sudden it looks good to them. And God is continually doing that in our lives. He wants us to have this ever-increasing glory, which comes, I want you to get this, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So can you sanctify yourself? People say, I'm walking in sanctification. And you know what they mean by that? I got it under control. I am keeping myself in check. That's pride. And you know what happens when you get prideful? Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. It, it's the Lord who is doing this in us. It's not us who are doing it. Our part in the process is just cooperate with him. Just, just go along with whatever he wants to do. Some bad comes along and you whine and you say, oh God, why did you let this happen to me? Where's God? I, blah, 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 blah. The Charlie Brown TV commercials. <laughs> what should we be doing? In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We ought to be saying, God, this is hard. And I don't necessarily like this. But you're up to something here. You're trying to do something either in me or through me. And you go ahead. That ought to be our attitude. But, you know, we're spoiled Americans. So remember, sanctification is something that God does in us as we submit our lives to the kingship of Jesus. Here's another one. The third stage in this process that God wants to bring people through to get them into the kingdom. He says, you were justified I like that one the word justified is translated from a Greek word that means to be declared not guilty now, I want to give you this it does not mean that the person in question is not guilty it means that in spite of our guilt God chooses to view us as not guilty guilty because Jesus has already paid the penalty for our sin and rescued us from sin's condemnation. You get that? The judge looks at the case, and by the way, the judge in this case is King Jesus. The judge looks at the case and he says, hey, the penalty for that one's already been paid. And he throws it out of court. And he's not guilty. Doesn't mean that you aren't guilty. It means that somebody else paid the penalty for you so the judge can look at it from a legal standpoint and say, justified, not guilty. That, and, and when we begin to understand that, that will make us love Judge Jesus. People in the world today love Judge Judy. We need to love Judge Jesus. Do you get that? I'm telling you, when, when you're guilty and Jesus comes, comes along and takes all the penalty for your sin and satisfies the, the legal requirements for your sin, and then the judge says, okay, not guilty. 
That ought to make you love Jesus. And if you love him, you'll be willing to submit to his kingship. Now, understanding that we were justified will motivate us to live transformed lives by his power. Paul wrote this. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't you love that? It's because God looks at us and says, huh, he's not guilty. So there's no reason for me to pass sentence on him. There's no condemnation. And that's what Paul says. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, they're not living according to the power of their flesh because they have submitted to the kingship of Jesus and now they're living according to his power as it's made available to us through his spirit. Because that's what he says. Those who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. I want you to notice the natural order. When we realize we are justified, that is there's no condemnation, then rather than live according to the demands of the flesh, we'll be motivated to live according to the demands of the Spirit. Just do what the Holy Spirit shows you from Scripture. He wants you to do every day. That's submitting to the kingship of Jesus. That's what he says makes you, from his perspective, a functioning part of his kingdom remember it's not you talk it's the power that you're living by so at some point during this process then God grants us entrance into his kingdom Paul described this fact when he when he wrote this to the believers at Colossae I love this verse it's in Colossians 1 13 he said this referring to Jesus he says he has rescued us you know I tell you sometimes when we read that word saved it means rescued that's what he does here he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So in this process at some point, what does God do? Rescues us from the darkness and brings us into the kingdom of his son. So here's the conclusion. During the age in which we live, the kingdom of God consists of everyone who has not only believed in Jesus, but is also submitted to his kingship and is living a transformed life by his power, not your own power. You know, I know people that will say, I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for Jesus if it hair lips ever cow in Texas. I'm going to do it. I hate to tell you this, but you can't do it. Only he can do it through you if you're just willing to surrender, just submit to his kingship. And so that's, the, that's who the kingdom is today. It's those who not only believe in him, but have submitted to his kingship and are living a transformed life by his power. Citizenship in the kingdom of God is largely a matter of the heart. You get that? Citizenship in the kingdom is largely a matter of the heart. Jesus said to first century Jewish disciples in, in Luke 17, 21, because this, this aspect of the kingdom today is much the same as it was when the kingdom uh, was designed for the nation of Israel in the first phase. He said this, the kingdom of God is within you. Isn't that cool? The kingdom of God is where? within you God is the king and his kingdom consists of everyone who has allowed him to rule as king in their hearts the kingdom of God is within you his kingdom exists wherever his people submit to his kingship over their lives obviously living this kind of life includes functioning as a member of a local church Again, people say, oh, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. <laughs> well, based on what we, all these scriptures we've looked at, you decide. Paul clearly indicated that the kingdom of God and every church are synonymous. We already read that, but let's really read it one more time. I am sending to you, Timothy, my son, whom I love 
who is faithful in the Lord, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Get that? Every church. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Every church and the kingdom of God are used synonymously there. So the first step toward gaining access to the kingdom of God as it exists today, as it will exist at the end of this age in which we are living, uh, which is what we're going to talk about next week, that thousand-year kingdom of God on the earth. And then as it will exist in eternity, um, the first step toward gaining access to all that is to hear the Jesus story, believe it, and receive the incredible gift of eternal life. If you don't believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord meaning master, owner, boss, Jesus meaning savior, rescuer, deliverer, Christ meaning king. If you don't believe that that's who he is, you don't believe his story and receive eternal life, then you'll never see the kingdom. That's what Jesus explained to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, and then verse 16. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For you to function in an eternal kingdom... And that's, that's where we're headed in the developmental stages of this. It's an eternal, forever, never-ending kingdom. For you to function in that, you've got to have eternal, never-ending, forever life. And Jesus came so you could have it. So you could have eternal life. And just in case, there might be someone here today who has never heard and never believed the story. I want to tell it to you one more time.